so, uh, Sarah, if I can start with you first, if I may. Um, does what you've just been hearing from Larissa, does that accord with your understanding of what you've seen yourself at first hand with the growth of, it would seem, of attacks, continuing growth of attacks, and of what might lie behind them and of the measures being taken to deal with it? Yeah, very much so, actually. Um, I actually I'm, I've really enjoyed reading Larissa's book. I agree with a lot of what uh, she discusses in the book, and it resonates with my personal experience as an aid worker, but even more with the research that we've been doing at HPG over the last you know, decades and, and, and more on, uh, on these issues, you know, both directly uh, on uh, um, violence you know, against aid workers, but more generally on humanitarian space. Um, over the last few years, we've really tried hard to document how there has never really been a golden age of humanitarian action. There is almost a mythology about the fact that you know, there was a, a past where things were easier and you know, there was less violence and um, in a way um, aid workers were immune from you know, um, attacks being waged against them. And our humanitarian history project shows very clearly how that is not true. Um, you know, if you look at uh, the, I don't know, the Italian, Italian Ethiopian war where you know, the ICR was fired on or you know Biafra I mean there's countless examples in the past of you know aid workers coming under attack now obviously figures are going up but as you know Larissa has already said so is the number of um, aid workers you know exponentially and more importantly I would say what has changed is the fact that um, humanitarian um, actors are pushed more and more into the the front lines so it's not just uh, the rise in number, it's the fact that we work really at the height of the action more and more. That for me is the, the most significant difference with the past, you know, where humanitarian action would take place perhaps more you know, in refugee camps on the other side of the borders, where you know, the constraint of sovereignty sort of limited you know, the, um, if you would, engagement to a certain type of terrain. Um, and, and where you know perhaps um, there was less pressure also from um, politicians and others, um, you know, donor agencies to see humanitarian action at the height of the violence. Today we become a sub substitute for political action. You know, humanitarian assistance is the one response many countries offer um, when you know political action is paralyzed, and so inevitably, you know, sort of funding organizations to be at the front of a, a response in a very dangerous area becomes, you know, one way of, uh, um, if you want, uh, um, signaling that you are responding to a crisis where actually there is very limited political engagement. And I wonder whether one current example of that in your mind would be northern... Well, I wonder whether one current example of that for you would be northern Iraq, the current humanitarian operations there. To an extent, but Syria more starkly... At, at a time of um, high emotions and uh, definitely, great but distress. I, I think the last three and a half years of the conflict in Syria and you know, seeing the, the paralysis, the political paralysis around that and the very you know, meek diplomatic engagement to you know, uh, sort of solve the crisis, to, to, you know, to, to give a lasting solution to the crisis, for me, is, is really you know, significant. Whereas we see you know, humanitarian, and I'm sure Ray can say a lot more about it, uh, this, encouraged to really be at the, at the forefront of, uh, of the response. Uh, thanks very much indeed for, for now anyway. And that does bring us naturally, I think, on to uh, Ray and indeed not only Syria, but perhaps particularly um, Syria. Uh, first of all, overall, how do you respond to what, what you've heard from Larissa and, and indeed share something of the experience of, of working in Syria? Yes, I, um, I think first of all that the book is very timely. Um, and I'm sure looking at the introduction and summary, there are going to be uh, points that we differ on, etc. Uh, and that's important because I think there's need for a dialogue. It's long, long overdue. Um, and I, I think Syria is a very good example of uh, NGOs sometimes finding themselves uh, working in hot conflict and discovering that they're working in hot conflict. And that's an indication that we need to be uh, we need to be really engaged. You can't accidentally uh, discover that this is much worse than you expected it to be. And, and at the core of, th uh, of this is, first of all, the security and conflict analysis has to be integral to your work. 
it, it can't be an external um, uh, a, an external advisory panel or something of that nature. You have to have it there with you. Um, and the difference between different kinds of conflicts, uh, particularly, for instance, uh, the difference between what the military would call low-intensity conflict um, and what you have uh, in Syria and in parts of North Iraq at the moment of, uh, of hot conflict. Uh, because that's where your wrong place, wrong time chance of becoming an incidental victim, uh, it becomes exceptionally higher. And therefore, your decision to work there in the first place and your decision how you're going to work there and how you're going to balance uh, the scale of your operations against the risks you're taking, because that's important. It might not be the way people want to think of it, but that's very real. Uh, so, uh, those things have to be mm. taken into account. So you're throwing out a challenger, if you like, to all uh, aid agencies involved in, in that kind of environment on the recruitment, the deployment, the training, and the briefing of those who are, who are going to be working there. Absolutely, um, and uh, and also the recognition that what one organisation does, uh, it's not just an internal issue if they're not uh, if they're not fully prepared to to work uh, in those circumstances. It has a knock-on impact for other organisations. Mm -hmm. uh, it has a knock-on impact for their beneficiaries. Uh, so those are very important issues, and we've got to talk about them. And we have to talk about them in a context where we can be open, honest, without everyone getting upset and defensive. And at the moment, do you see much evidence of aid organizations changing the way that they are working uh, as you feel is necessary? I think it would be fair to say not enough. Um, and, and, uh, and I think what has happened, particularly with Syria, it's been a wake-up call. Uh, I think... To some extent, Libya was probably the beginnings of that for some agencies, but certainly uh, I think the long-running um, situations such as Sudan, uh, while they should have woken us up, they didn't because everybody got into their own way of working. Um, finding yourself in the middle of a hot conflict where particularly your local staff, along with the community, uh, were exposed to far more daily uh, bombardment than most soldiers would ever experience in their careers. Those are, those are serious issues. We can't just say, oh, it's very tough. Uh, thanks very much indeed for now. And uh, Sarah, if you just want to take uh, the microphone. Um, as far as ICRC is concerned, I was very struck this morning, and we spoke about it just for uh, coming here onto the stage. Um, by a very strong, what seemed to be a very strongly worded statement from the ICRC on conditions in Gaza and how the rules of um, humanitarian action and, and uh, recognition of neutrality and so on of the ICRC being broken at the moment there. This is what the statement says, and making it extremely difficult to do any work. Um, so talk about, uh, if, if you also give your general thoughts, please, on what Larissa was saying, the challenges he was showing out, but also to some extent on, on those sort of things that you're dealing with. Sure, yeah, thank you very much. And just to, to reiterate that the, the book is extremely interesting and it's very good to hear Larissa discuss it here. I think um, one of the things that, I mean, and I, uh, that was certain to a certain extent echoing um, my colleagues here on the, on the panel, but one of the things is that clearly working in a conflict environment involves some risk and every organisation has to come to terms with that. But the risk has to be proportionate to the humanitarian gain, to the humanity that, that Larissa mentioned. And, and certainly if, if, if the risk is disproportionate one way or the other, if there is too much to be gained and not enough risk taken, then it leads to the discrediting of one organisation. But clearly reckless decisions can be, can be taken if the risk is not, for, for a smaller gain, the risk is too much. So that's just one of the things to, to balance. And, and one of the ways in which, and I think this goes perhaps to the point that Ray was making about information, um, and really understanding your environment. One of the, the ways in which the ICRC tries to, to handle this and to, to make sure that it makes the right choices is, is through 
decentralized security approach. So with its, um, its sort of our s uh, the way in which we try to keep our humanitarian staff safe is by both relying on the the work we do, the job that we're we've been given to to undertake in conflict, the way in which we work, which is independent and impartial and neutral, but most importantly needs to be seen as such. And then, of course, the, the the specific requirements of the context in 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 mind, and I think that's something that 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 really has hopefully allowed the organisation, the ICRC, to work in places where otherwise it wouldn't be able to. And to apply that briefly to to Gaza, I mean, you're right. Certainly for us, it was an extremely strongly worded statement and and update. Um, yeah, in a conflict that just in Gaza in 37 days, 1,900 people were killed, 10,000 wounded, 400,000 displaced, 16,000 homes are now uninhabitable. And then, of course, on the other side in Israel, there were 77 people injured, three civilians killed, and, and certainly destruction there as well. And I think that there's just one thing that's not been said is that there is a law of armed conflict. There is international humanitarian law, and that law is to protect civilians and uh, and also combatants but to make sure that the war is played by the rules that the this this is this is long standing this is not new but equally sadly the the disrespect of these rules is is not new and um and unfortunately humanitarians are often a visible sign of 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 that disrespect but actually the the point of the humanitarians being in place is to try and help those 400,000 displaced and what the ICRC currently struggles with in Gaza is the fact that this ceasefire which was renewed early sort of 1 a.m. or whatever it was this morning is is still not lasting this is this is not something that either humanitarians or people on the ground can guarantee will give them security in the long run and when you have 80 percent of homes without power how is that electricity going to be um, securely and long lastingly delivered to homes which which you know, and there was a moving story on that I heard from our colleague um, a couple of weeks ago, who had worked very hard and in extremely difficult conditions to to um, to get a, s a, a series of engineers out to repair a power line in in Gaza and managed to get the lights to be turned on for just six hours before the next bombardment meant that 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 power line that had been fixed was broken again. And this is this is no way to live for either the humanitarians or the people on the ground. Can I just um, take round the three of you uh, before we do now open it up to all of you? Um, it's something we haven't really talked about in detail yet, but that Larissa and, and I discussed, um, which is uh, things to do with the lifestyle of aid workers and uh, um, clashes of cultural values, what you might wear, um, particularly in more conservative places, going out to nightclubs, this kind of thing. I mean, aid workers are obviously like anybody else, but um, demonstrating that. <laughs> Uh, obviously can pose local challenges and, and in a way, book suggests, um, cause troubles and risks sometimes, not just for them, but, but for others ar around them. Um, would you all uh, accept that? Do you think it's an important issue and, and probably a contributory factor to some of the violence that's occurred? In the order. Okay, just I have my microphone in my hand, yeah, so yeah, I'll yeah, jump yeah, in. Yeah, um, <laughs> no, uh, thank you very much. I, it's certainly a, a factor, and I think that the the way in which individuals represent their organisation is fundamental, and they they must be aware of um, what is expected of them working in a in a given culture, and that includes dress and behaviour and 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 the rest. And I think that it does, however, go back a little bit to the point that Larissa and, and um, my other co-panelists mentioned about the the number of national staff staff from a given country that that work for an organisation and these these uh, colleagues are extremely important to, to both help develop an understanding of, of what is appropriate modes of behavior, but then also prevent, um, but then also can give a, give a friendly face, a local face to an organization, which is extremely important. One thing I just quickly also add to that is that it's not just humanitarians, but also healthcare workers specifically, who are often the direct target of, um, of of violence and this again is local healthcare workers and and there are a number of of well obviously they much like everybody else have to abide by international law but there's also a, the added layer of medical ethics which means that in addition to their dress and to their behavior according to to local customs and also their their appreciation of the needs of their patients they must ensure that for example, they protect um, patients from media intrusion if this is a particularly sensitive environment which is drawing a lot of attention or another area. So really they face similar challenges to humanitarians. Job, sure. thanks very much. Right. Yeah, I, 
I agree, uh, but I think very often that's an easy response uh, to uh, to blame uh, the behaviour of aid workers, um, and I and I think that does happen sometimes. Uh, Organisations and individual workers do um, act uh, in a in a, uh, a bad way sometimes, but I think. One of the things that's much more important is for organizations, first of all, really to think in sensitive situations exactly how many international staff they need and not to overload. Uh, because a lot of international staff without enough work to do, um, a frightening thought for me at the moment that anyone should exist uh, of that kind, but that is, that is where some of the problems exist. Um, so it's it, it's serious, but I don't think it's one of the core issues. Yeah. And I think that's important. But mo what what's more important is really you know the analysis that Ray was talking about at the beginning in terms of understanding who you put in a particular situation, um, including you know sort of moving away from the assumption that often many organisations make that you know national staff may be safer in a certain context, but understanding which national staff, you know, sometimes ethnic affiliations or religious affiliations or political, you know, affiliation perception may actually endanger the national staff a lot more than an expatriate. So really making sure that you have the right analysis, who can be deployed in a particular situation. But We've talked a lot about, you know, the, the, if you want the negatives, I think I would also like to talk a little bit about the positive and what's, uh, you know, before we open it up, because I think we've also seen um, through our research some, you know, s some clear improvements um, from not definitely not on a large scale, but we see organizations starting to invest more in understanding do that local context, in you know, putting a serious amount of money and time in exploring, you know, s uh, the, the, if you want, understanding the local norms and customs and investing in the engagement with belligerents, you know, to make sure that their staff are safer. The research that we have done in terms of engagement with the Taliban and with Al-Shabaab have actually, you know, brought up some very important examples, you know, in Kandahar, province in Faria province with the Taliban we have seen organizations have spent a year you know discussing with the community with the Taliban before deploying their staff to make sure that they were well prepared before you know opening an operation before running programs they, they understood clearly what was possible what was not you know on what terms you know what were the type of people they could deploy how the types of programs they could run um, that's that's you know important to emphasize because um, while it doesn't give you immunity for your staff, it definitely makes it a lot safer um, than, you know, in th than just sort of um, what we see from a lot of other organizations that don't make the same investment. Good. Right, time to open up. Sorry you've had to, and thank you for your patience. Um,